Uh, this is January 30th, 2017, uh, at the Institute for Policy Studies. It, this is a project uh, to document uh, social justice organizing in Washington, D.C., 1960 to 75. We're called the Lessons of the 60s. Today we're interviewing Jim Drew, lawyer, activist, former president of the D.C. National Lawyers Guild. Um, Jim, how did you end up in Washington, D.C., and when did you get here? I came here, uh, I was going to come in May, I think, of 1968, but uh, they were burning the stock market in Paris, so I decided to spend the summer in, in Europe, which I did, and I came then in uh, end of September 1968 to go to work at the Public Defender Service. And I just finished a, a defender program in Chicago at Northwestern. And, so that's how, that's when I came here, and that's why I came here. Why did you decide on Washington, D.C.? Well, when I got out of that program, it was a two-year program, and one year was on campus, and the second year you were placed in a defender or prosecutor's office, depending on which branch of the program you were in. I was in the defender program, uh, in some city in the country. Uh, and they paid, so, you know, any office would accept you, and I was going to go either to Las Vegas, because I had a great public defender's office there, or to Washington, because I figured it would be the federal rules here, and if I left, uh, it would be more transferable to take those skills back to Washington or Illinois or wherever I went. It, it, it was that kind of decision, actually. Um, after I arrived here, uh, you know, I got embedded into the community and you said you were wedded to D.C. Was that, was that when you first came here, or when you lived here for a couple, for a couple of years? I said wedded now? Yeah, you said uh, previously to me oh, that you oh. became wedded to D.C. Yeah, it, wasn't, it didn't take very long. I mean, because when you're practicing law, you really get involved deeply with the court system and know who's who and you know, where to go to get this and that. Uh, and then involved politically in the mostly anti-war struggles that were going on at that time, and uh, and then you know socially and it, within before that year was up, I knew I was going to stay. Put it that way. Um, yes, and you got uh, involved. Well, you, you you told me that when you came here, you already were an anti-war activist. You were deeply involved already in the anti-war. Yeah, and I was. The, so the big next thing you did when you got here was you started to get active with the National Lawyers Guild. And we wanted to know a little bit about the Lawyers Guild. What's the history of the National Lawyers Guild? And, uh, uh, what was it formed for? Well, I can give you the history. When I first arrived in D.C., the Guild really did not exist in D.C. for about another year. But the Guild was formed in 1937 and it was organized by progressive lawyers, liberal lawyers, progressive lawyers, every Communist Party member lawyer in the country came together and formed it. And it was uh, founded here in Washington. There's a great photograph at the, what's the name of the hotel, the Whitman Wardlow? Oh, yeah. Wardman Hotel. Wardman Hotel, yes. And there were about 500 people at a banquet and they formed the guild. And the reason it it's was... 1937. 1937. The reason it was formed is that at that time, the American Bar Association, the ABA, did not allow African American members. Uh, and it also, the ABA, was sort of death on all the New Deal programs. So all the lawyers who I've just described who were uh, supportive of the New Deal, which included a lot of African-American lawyers, uh, got themselves together and formed the National Lawyers Guild. And it grew very rapidly initially. I mean, there were 500 people at the founding convention, but it grew very rapidly, had a lot of um, sort of prominent members, a number of folks that went on to become judges. Um, even at its beginning, it was sort of attacked as being communist controlled, et cetera, which it never was, although, as I said, every left and communist lawyer in the country was a member of it, but they never controlled it and never tried to control it. Um, 
one story is Thurgood Marshall wanted to join because he supported the Guild, its program, and a lot of his friends were in the Guild, and he was very pointedly told, don't join. You're going to be a Supreme Court justice one day, <laughs> and this will be a difficult hurdle for you to get overcome. So he was told not to come, That's a, not to join. That's a story from David Ryan. In the, and then in the late 40s, uh, the, the Red Scare sort of kicked in, and, uh, yeah. not, uh, and the local chapter really went. Yeah, it actually it was earlier than it was in the early 40s when things really began. Um, but in the late 40s, in the McCarthy era, the Guild, which had a very vibrant, vibrant chapter in, in D.C., uh, a lot of government lawyers were members, and uh, shrank down to three members. Who were those three? Uh, Joe Four, who you know, David Ryan, um, and Selma Samuels. Selma, bless her heart, just passed away January 7th of this year at the age of 103. Uh, but those were the only three uh, throughout the 50s and early 60s. And then the Guild sort of, along with the New Left, reformed in the late 60s. Uh, Bernadette Dorn and other people were sort of uh, main organizers. And the Guild chapter in Washington, D.C. had a, an initial refounding meeting in December of 1969, which I attended along with about 25 other lawyers, and we all joined and refounded the chapter. I mean, I suppose technically the three members constituted the chapter, but <laughs> but Did those it, three members come to the revival meeting. Or well, they they were active in organizing it. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, unlike in some cities, there wasn't the conflict in D.C. between the new left and the old left, at least within the legal sphere of things. So then, you know, uh, throughout the, well, that refounding of chapters was happening all over the country, including in the South. And the Guild, uh, mid-70s, had about 5,000 attorney members around the country, which is, you know, pretty big and pretty strong. And we decided at a convention, I think it was in Boulder, Colorado, to admit law students who had always been a division of the Guild, admit them to full membership. And sometime later, probably in the 80s, I don't recall, uh, we admitted legal workers, meaning those folks that work full time on legal things but aren't lawyers, uh, staff people in the Guild, for one, but others. One of the things I wanted to interject is a um, question about you were filling a gap that the ACLU was not <coughs> filling. Cases they wouldn't go for? Well, a little bit. I mean, the Guild and the ACLU has always had a close relationship, but occasionally a difficult relationship. But on the whole, I would say a close relationship, particularly in Washington. And the two different kinds of organizations. I mean, the Guild is primarily a lawyer and legal uh, person's organization. Whereas the ACLU is made up of mostly non-lawyers, uh, and then, then they have volunteer lawyers that do cases, but the, the bulk of their membership is non-lawyers who are just supportive of their work. <coughs> um, so it leads to kind of a different direction in a way. They tend to take on big cases only, and cases that you can kind of build up to and that take a long time, and that are great cases to take, really. Uh, whereas the Guild is more apt to, well, we have some big, great cases as well, more apt to uh, jump into the streets and side by side with whatever movement is going on, whether it's a civil rights movement or the anti-war movement. Very activist personalities yeah. in the organization. For instance, in uh, the early 60s, the Guild opened an office in Mississippi and sent a few lawyers to be there full time and then sent other lawyers to go to uh, various civil rights conferences and meetings in the South and worked with African-American lawyers in the South um, 
and did all those kinds of things that the ACLU really couldn't do and can't do. Um, in fact, one of the reasons that the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law was formed is because John F. Kennedy was a little worried that the Guild was having too much of a left influence <laughs> on the Civil Rights Movement. Um, you know, he was correct about the influence, but it wasn't too much, I'd say. <laughs> uh, in any event, that's, that's kind of the distinction. I mean, the, you know, Guild lawyers tend to go to demonstrations and then the next morning are in court representing the people that were arrested. Um, and Guild lawyers tend to be, um, I would say, much more political in a left and oftentimes a hard left kind of way Whereas ACLU lawyers, um, some of the best ACLU lawyers are probably Republicans, but just happen to really believe in the First Amendment. Um, so that's kind of the distinction. But you need both organizations. And, um, so with the, when you revived this organization, you said about 25 people at the founding mm -hmm. thing. Uh, what were the first kinds of cases or things people got involved in after the revival? Well, I mean, at the time, a lot of those 25, and we grew, but a lot of those 25 were law students. Um, and another, a good number of the others were clerking for judges or worked in the federal or D.C. government. We had only a few. I mean, I worked for Public Defender Service, which was a trial practice, but I couldn't just jump into some other case. Um, so we only had a few lawyers in private practice. But we had, you know, a good number, and what we mostly did was demonstration cases and civil rights and Black Panther cases, um, the specific cases I'm not going to really recall for you, but they were those kinds of, of, uh, of cases. Uh, we also did, like, uh, I'm thinking of different organizations, Iranian Student Association, uh, a little later on, Friends of the Filipino People, other organizations who f needed help, either because they were being politically harassed or maybe they just needed help because they needed to lease an office and didn't quite know how to do that. So they would call the Guild and we would put them in touch with a member who would help them. So, you know, we were... Uh, the slogan at the time was legal counsel for the movement, which was pretty accurate, but that also doesn't always mean that you're arguing to a, a jury in, a, in Angela Davis' case. It might mean that you're helping to, you know, lease an office for an organization that uh, needed it, whatever, you know, whatever was needed, I guess. Um, well, you, saw, you said in our pre-interview that um, your work with the Guild, uh, in those years at least, was primarily as a Black Panthers lawyer. So let's talk about some of those things that you did here in uh, Washington, D.C. for the Panthers. Well, uh, you know, I did general support work, educational work, uh, a few actual legal cases in court. Um, Well, yeah, that Tell us was about that. <laughs> uh, that was actually I wasn't nervous about that until a few years afterwards when I really thought about it. But during that era, the Panthers were under not just political attack but uh, violent attack by the FBI and other police groups. Uh, the Fred Hampton shooting being the you know the easiest example. Anyway, Panther officers around the country kind of, uh, you know, took pains to protect themselves, got locks on their doors, had, you know, things inside their office to protect themselves. But they also called on, uh, I suppose they did in other cities, but at least in D.C., on the Guild and said, you know, Jim, can you come and stay over tonight because we're getting a lot of drive-by police car traffic and we're concerned that maybe they'll you know, come to the door or bust in or something. And if you can come and wear a coat and tie and, you know, go stand on the front porch every so often and let them see you, it probably will have a deterrent effect. So, so that's what I did. And, uh, you know, other than 
the nervous aspect of it. It was just kind of very enjoyable and sitting around and talking and, you know. But I did that here a couple of times at the office on 18th Street. Um, they also had an office on, on 7th Street, just below, uh, what's the name of the school there? Uh, Roosevelt, I think. Just below New Hampshire, or, or just below Rhode Island, near what used to be the Southern Restaurant. Anyway, that was their neighborhood office that they used to, uh, for free breakfast programs and for teaching kids. And, and I was there a few times, although that was not a sleepover kind of office. Um, and I remember going down to Richmond on one occasion and staying over in their house there. Although the reason I went there is because there was a, a panther that was uh, up for some kind of hearing, it wasn't a trial, but some kind of hearing before, I think it was Judge Marriage in, in U.S. District Court in Richmond. So I was there for that, but ended up staying, staying overnight at the house, which was kind of fascinating because, uh, like as I mentioned, it was, there were like 15, 20 folks living there, all... African American, a couple of older Panthers, but uh, the majority looked like 15, 16, 17 year old kids that maybe had, you know, estrangement from their home and so were living there, uh, going to school, you know, reading uh, all kinds of political things while I was there. So <laughs> they weren't wasting their time. But it was just an interesting kind of you know, group of people, and I was, when I was there, I was imagining, gee, if they have houses like this in every city of the country, this is the, you know, the seeds of something big to come. That wasn't quite what, what the Black Panther House in Washington, D.C. was like, right? There weren't that many young kids living there? I didn't yeah. see any young kids. In fact, the two offices, the house on 18th Street, I'm not so sure if that was residential. I suspect it was up on the 2nd and 3rd, but I didn't go up there. Uh, but my impression of it was that it was more meeting room, office space. But I was only on the first floor in that office. But everybody that I knew and met with the Panthers in D.C. was an adult, a young adult, but, you know, not a kid. Um, hmm. In your work with the Panthers, um, did you... Um did you accompany them on marches and things like that, or was that just in the peace movement that you did that? You told me that, that as a lawyer, you would always march up front to kind of yeah. keep things calm. Is that true with the Panther activities, or, or are you talking just about the peace movement? Not with the Panthers. Yeah. I don't think the Panthers did much marching, no. to tell you the truth. Uh, but it would be with the, you know, a pro-Cuban demonstration or anti-Contra demonstration or Philippine demonstration or or just a community demonstration, um, you know, uh, we would get a call, the Guild would, saying we're having this demonstration, is there a lawyer that could be available? And at the time, I kind of knew who in the Guild was apt to be going to that demonstration anyway, so I would contact them, and if no one was me, and tell them, uh, you know, you be the Guild lawyer there and kind of introduce yourself to the organizers and just sort of be available in case there's any conflict or anything happens. And when I would go, that's what I would do. And then I would march in this, you know, the second or third row. And if the police stopped the demonstration, I would move up and, you know, with a high sign to the organizer who was tending to get into an argument with them, see if I could give the cop my card and kind of shift them away and convince them it would be a lot simpler and easier and better for all concerned if they would just let the march go on the way it wanted to go and, you know, there'd be no problems and that'll be that. And, and that approach generally worked. Not always, but, but, but generally because... Non-confrontational. Well, and lawyers can do that and do it off to the side, whereas where the cops confront the leaders of a march, the cops get their back up, and the leaders of the march have to be strong, and, and, it's, and it is confrontational. So, so that was, you know, kind of a good function that we did at those marches. That we made them made it possible for them to 
continue on. That's I guess. why you were always all, all the marches I went to. That was your function. I just thought you would like to come to the last marches, right? Both. You were always, <laughs> you were always there. Yeah. Well, all, also, let's talk about your peace activism. That was as extensive and as important as your um, Panther work. Um, you said you were an activist already in Indiana or in, or in Chicago before you came here. Were you, in, were you at the Chicago A6A convention? I'm just curious. Were you there? I was in Europe. Oh, you, oh, that's right, you were in Europe. Right? But I was at the planning meetings okay. for those demonstrations, um, which occurred over the winter before. And, um, you know, there must have been 40, 50 people that met around this big room and a church, as I recall. And I was with a person there who also was part of that planning, a person in Chicago who was also part of that planning. Um, and, you know, there was just the normal kind of planning, how to get this constituent group, that constituent group. And I, I remember, um, it's either Abby Hoffman or, or, or Ruben, saying, the whole world will be watching, <laughs> which I didn't think too much of at the time, but it turned out to be quite the phrase that <laughs> sort of marked it. And Rennie Davis came to some of those meetings. And I, you know, there were like 50 people there Aside from those three and a few others, they were all Chicago folks. And I was there kind of with my friend because I was relatively new to Chicago. But, you know, I sort of saw things develop. And, and in, as soon as that semester was out at, at Northwestern, kind of at the last minute, Really, when I saw they were burning the stock market <laughs> in Paris, <laughs> I said, I got to go. So I quickly got a uh, path or a visa, whatever, and, and off I went and spent the summer, you know, as a lot of college students do, hitchhiking around and reading about all of this in the Herald Tribune and then coming back and saying, wow, that was great. <laughs> I missed it, though. <laughs> but uh, But I sort of knew what was going to happen. I mean, I knew it was going to be, yeah, I mean, there weren't plans to uh, violent per se, but there was going to be no back and down. And given Chicago cops and Mayor Daly, you just knew that there was going to be a confrontation, which there was, you know, and which everybody knew there was going to be. And um, so. So you must have, you, you came, you were in Europe and then you came here in the 68. So you were in town all of 69, living here for the huge demonstrations of the next two years, yeah. the biggest one being November yeah. 69. Did you have a role in that particular or, um, organization? That was the biggest one ever. Yeah. Thousand people. Well, but I had a role through the guild because whenever the demonstrations occurred, we always, we had a little office on 5th Street, and we would set up shop, and a phone number was passed around and passed out and and whatever arrests there were we either took care of them or made sure they were taken care of. I did go to, uh, I forget the names now, there was MOBE and then there was another group and I, I went to the meetings of the one that uh, David Dillinger and the Communist Party and were part of. That was new MOBE. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and didn't play a big role but I kind of, you know, was there sort of for the guild and got a feel for the background organizing of it. Um, and on the day of the demonstrations, generally I just went to the demonstrations. Uh, I can't think which ones, but I think the latter ones you really couldn't go to because they had the tear gas out and, you know, uh, you ended up getting tear gassed. Yeah. Um, but the initial big ones were, you know, uh, very sunny, song-filled events of several hundred thousand on the, you know, on the grass near the Washington Monument, and uh, very pleasant, very nice. Um, and there are some rests, but just on the fringe, I guess. But the la latter demonstrations got to be, you know, pretty tough, and uh, a lot of tear gas used. And I remember once marching down Pennsylvania Avenue towards the Capitol building, passing the Justice Department, and who should be out on the ledge 
on a, the top, one of the top floors of the Justice Department, but John Mitchell. The Attorney General. The Attorney General. Yeah. And everybody in the crowd saw him and started booing at him, and he looked down and he shook his fist at everybody. <laughs> it was the weirdest thing. <laughs> we all felt quite successful that we had irritated him that much. <laughs> And then he went to jail, of course. Anyway. Um, Were you involved in uh, monitoring of May Day? Uh, and, yeah. And the 13,000 arrests or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Weekend. Yeah, I was, uh, I mean, initially I was just a participant in May Day. Uh, and I might have mentioned this to you. I remember going to uh, uh, where the gathering should have been. I think on the mall, I'm not sure, and there was no one there, and a few stragglers, I said, where is everybody? And they said, they're on Georgetown's campuses. So I hiked up there, and I got to the edge of the campus looking down on, I think is the football field or athletic field, and that's where everybody was. And there was a big open flatbed trailer, and Pete Seeger was on there singing songs. Uh, damn, you know, this is like a Hollywood movie. <laughs> it's not what I thought, but afterwards thinking about it, that's what it was like. Oh, by the way, May 71, just to fill in the year. Uh, yeah. April, April, May. Was yeah. Right. May Day. <laughs> so, uh, but then afterwards, there were all these arrests, like 15,000 or something. And, uh, and people wanted to stay in jail, you know. Well, they were initially not in jail. They were all locked up, I think, in the parking lot at RFK or something. And I remember just staying up around the clock because the court stayed open around the clock to get people out. And so I was doing that. And then I remember walking into one courtroom. Judge Green, Harold Green, was the judge. And who should be there arguing a habeas corpus petition but Joe Four? saying these folks, 15,000, were being held in lawful conditions. And, uh, you know, it was either granted or very soon the cops got rid of enough people and, you know, but... Uh, and I think Selma Samuels was involved in getting a lot of people out of... Selma was involved. Selma was... Uh, um, or David Ryan was involved. Salma's daughter, I think, was involved in Days of Rage uh, in, in Chicago, which I think was after that was the convention. It was after, yeah, it was after the, that was 69, Days of Rage. Yeah. That was around the conspiracy trial. <coughs> oh, right, yeah. That's right. yeah. Anyway, I remember that only because she flew out there and zip, 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 worked out a deal for her daughter and got her the hell out of there because <laughs> she said she didn't want her facing felony charges and all that worked out well. Did, you, but, did the guilt have anything to do with the, with the case against uh, um, D.C.? Everybody, a lot of people got money right, yeah. from that case. Did the, was the guilt part of that? Uh, uh, yeah, let's see. I'm blocking on his name now. Um, Dan Chember. Mm. Uh, who was a very active guild member at the time, still is in the guild, was involved. Um, ACLU was involved. There was it was sort of a cooperative Forget, forgetting uh, effort to the people who were. What, what was the final thing that, uh, that that they gave money for? What did they say about it? It was unlawful, uh, uh, unlawfully detained or something. What, what was the I think it was that I, I don't recall exactly. I'm not, not. I'm not sure of my recollection, but I think it was because they didn't give them a chance to uh, disperse, which is the same thing as quite often happens. The Pershing Park thing a couple of years ago was the same. You know, um, a lot of rested on the steps of the Capitol when Ron Dellums was addressing them. Yeah. You know, that was one of the yeah. I know a couple of years ago, Art Spitzer at ACLU said he still has money in his trust account because he can't find out where individuals are to give him the money. <laughs> so I know two people who put themselves through law school from settlements. Uh, yeah. They got yeah. Day. yeah. Right. Yeah. No, DC has paid out a lot of money over the years. They may pay out uh, some more money in connection with arrests that were just made yes. a few days ago. 
because it's it's hard for them to learn. I think. Plus, they get the cops get frustrated and you know try and be good, and then boom, they. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. In that late sixties, early seventies, you became uh, president of the local chapter, uh, I believe, of the guild, somewhere in there. Yeah, when we formed, David Levy, who was went on to become the owner of the Biograph Theater, mm -hmm. was then a lawyer doing. Both. Yeah. He, he and Biograph. He was a lawyer doing anti-draft work, and he was designated as the president, or elected. Uh, we, he served for a while, and then he got too busy, and then a fellow named Roger Rice, who went up to Boston, Boston still is up there, was president, and when he left to go to Boston, folks looked at me, <laughs> so I ended up being president, and since I didn't leave town, I was president for four years. <laughs> Uh, and then we had a succession of, you know, other attorneys that were president. And in the late 90s, for some reason, folks turned to me again, and so I was elected president and served again for four more years, which is a great time to be president because that was the anti-globalization demonstrations which we coordinated, me relying on my <laughs> 60s and 70s <laughs> anti-war demonstration experience. But uh, So yeah, I've been president of the guild too long During that terms. earlier period, um, somebody named uh, Sheila O'Connor-Reese came to yeah, work yeah, in your yeah. office and tell us a little about yeah. that and what developed. Well, uh, our chapter, as were many organizations around the country, who found out about it, and probably many who never found out about it, was the subject uh, or the object of uh, an infiltration by this woman, Sheila O'Connor, who uh, did some volunteer work for us as, you know, and then sort of volunteered to increase her hours and worked almost full time for five, six months, I guess, <coughs> doing uh, office housekeeping kind of things, keeping track of the mailing list, mail, dealing with telephones. And, as I recall, no one had any complaints and she did an excellent job. She wasn't being paid. She, she, she wasn't being it. paid. Yes. So, you know, uh, hippies that we were at the time, it never dawned on us that that's kind of a red flag. You should be a little concerned when someone's not being paid. But we weren't. Uh, actually, she and her husband lived in a group house with another guild lawyer, and uh, it never crossed our mind. Plus, you know, she did good work, and we were kind of grateful of that, and not. But anyway, we got a call. This was shortly after the Austin, Texas convention. What year is this? <sighs> Must have been seventy-one. 72, maybe, early 70s. Uh, we got a call from a car rental. Oh, 73 is, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. A car rental company, and they said, uh, you know, when are you going to bring the car back? And we didn't know anything about the car. <laughs> and it turns out Sheila, who went to the convention, uh, had rented the car. Somehow, she didn't rent it in the guild name because she didn't have authority to do that, but she must have said, you know, contact me at the National Lawyers Guild, given our... our uh, address and phone number. Well, after the convention, we never saw her again, ever. Or the car. Well, we never saw the car. We never knew she rented the car. But uh, six weeks later, we got this phone call, and we said, we really don't know anything about it, and she's dropped out of sight as far as we're concerned. Although, I must say, at the time, we wouldn't have been surprised if, you know, a week or two later, she showed up. And that's how things were back in the 60s and 70s. People just kind of went on trips and not only road trips, but head trips, and <laughs> dropped out of sight for a while. Anyway, uh, so that really started us thinking, what the hell is going on here? Because that was a great breach of trust and uh, you know, unauthorized activity on her part. And about the same time, we got contacted by a New York State uh, legislative committee 
who were investigating her and her husband uh, as being agents or being um, spies or something. And that put two and two together. And anyway, about a, we never saw her again. I've never seen her in my life since then. But she did go to work for the John Birch congressman from Atlanta. Larry McDonald. McDonald. Yeah. And worked for him until he died in a plane crash. And I don't know, you know where she went after that. But there's one thing very unusual about her and her husband. Uh, unlike most infiltrators and whatever who were sent there by the FBI or by the police, I don't think that was the case with her because they were sort of entrepreneurial spies in a way. They had a, uh, a newsletter they put out and they got various police departments around the country to pay for it and subscribe to it and they sent information in this newsletter to all of them and that's how that's how they supported themselves. And they used the guild, because the guild was known and trusted to all these organizations, <laughs> you know, to, to, as a stepping stone. They, you know, I'm volunteer staff person for the Lawyers Guild, and I'd like to come to your meeting, and, or I'd like to ask you about this or that. So they, got, they used the guild to get information, I think, on other groups on the Guild as well, but, but on other groups, to put in their newsletter to sell to make money. Now, I'm, I'm not sure. They might have been paid for and sent by the FBI, but, but I, you know, I don't think so, but I don't really know. We are sitting in the Institute for Policy Studies where they also infiltrated here. Oh, they did? According to a Guild report, yes. Oh. Yes. They did, they did work here? They, or they did work here. I don't know to what extent, but it's... A, Seen it in a, including this yeah. thing about it. doesn't well, go into details. But. She dressed very young, and we were all late 20s, early 30s at the time, and she fit in. But I think she must have been 45 or 50 at that time. So I don't know if she's still living or not, that's what I'm saying. She must be quite old now. I think I saw something recently that they both are still living, maybe still mm -hmm. doing right wing stuff. Well, now's their day. <laughs> Hate to say. In the early 70s, <clears throat> you taught for a couple of years at the Antioch Law School. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I was you at, also participated in the Free Angel Davis movement <clears throat> when you were active on prison issues. Can you tell us a little about that? Well, I, I was at PDS for four years and then taught for two years, the first two years of Antioch Law School. It was... Uh, a good idea, but a very tumultuous place to go to school, and even more tumultuous to teach at after two years I left. Why was it tumultuous? Uh, everybody had their own idea on what a movement law school should be. You know, most of the students were radical to one degree or another. The people who founded the school and the leadership of the school were good, solid liberals, and there was a big conflict growing out of that. You know, we had to fight to get an evidence class taught because the deans thought that most of the students would change the world by working through federal bureaucracies and not trying cases. So there was, a, I mean, there was a basic political split which manifested itself in a lot of smaller things like what courses were offered and things like that. But it was a, it was a good place to go to school and a good place to teach. I don't mean to put it down in that regard. It was just, you know, there were meetings all night and it was... stay up all night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> prison stuff, um, that's sort of overlap between PDS and, and uh, Antioch. But at that time, Lorton was still the district's felony prison. And prisoners at the time were political and wanting to be even more political. So the guild would go down on a regular basis and take political books and some of the more advanced prisoners decided they wanted to start a newsletter, an internal newsletter, and they did and it got quashed by the administration. We brought down, you know, a couple of reams of paper 
every month, and they mimeographed it off and distributed it. So we had a, a lawsuit before Judge Ritchie, he was district court, who said they can have a newsletter, First Amendment rights, so long as they don't print uh, the architectural layout of the prison and, you know, the f tunnels that go to the outside and things like that, you know. And, and most of the articles, there were some political articles, a lot of poetry, some just stories. I mean, it was a, a very beautiful thing. It was, How long did that go on, that what newsletter? Uh, the newsletter went on for the better part of a year, I think. And then there was kind of a changeover. And, uh, um, but, you know, I mean, as in probably all prisons, there are some really bright people. And at that time, there were people reading Marx and Lenin and, you know, who really were, well, it was the Attica era and everything else. May still be the case. I know they're still bright people. I don't know whether they're reading Marx and Lenin, but, uh, uh, but you know, I haven't been in the prisons as much as I, as I used to be. Um, you asked about one other thing. I forget what it was. <laughs> Prisons and something else, but back to the peace movement. Yeah. Ooh, in 1973, you went to the, the Stockholm Peace Conference yeah. as the president of the guild, or as yourself? Were you, you were official delegate, right? Yeah, I was delegate. I suspect I got that by virtue of the guild. Okay. Um, what happened at that conference? <clears throat> was that that was right after the peace agreement was signed, trying uh, to end the, the Vietnam War. Is that correct? Peace agreements were signed in January 1973, and I think the yeah, Peace Conference. Yeah, this was in the spring of 74. Yeah, and the purpose of that was to, was to, what was the purpose of the Peace Conference? <coughs> well, um, you know, to bring peace, but uh, the, the uh, Paris Accords was a big part of it, and it was an analysis and an understanding and how to, what levers to pull and push to get, you know, folks to, to implement. Um, I was just talking to someone today about uh, a fellow named John McAuliffe, who was on that trip with me. He was an AFC yes, person who is now up in New York, who I haven't seen for... He takes, he takes uh, trips to Vietnam with, with various people uh, ah. a couple times a year. Great guy. Business people, and, uh, old anti-war people, and various... Yeah. Uh, there was another guy on the trip with me who I remember who had been a prisoner of war in North Vietnam. Bob Chenoweth? What's Bob his name? Chenoweth? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Chenoweth, right. Who probably still lives in the western Washington state, I think. Yeah, I think so. But anyway, a great guy. Yeah. And uh, he made it clear while he was a prisoner of war that he thought the Vietnamese were right, correct, and that everybody should join him in that view which they didn't. He was sort of ostracized, as you might imagine. Although he did travel widely with the Indochina Peace Campaign and spoke with them in the last two years of the war. I know, but, yeah. but he was, I'm saying, at the time, while he was imprisoned oh, fine, with, with, with other prisoners of war, he was, he was trying to lead them into taking an anti-war position, which, I mean, I wasn't there, but which he said none of them did, but he said I was honorable in, you know, in my position, I was I advocated what I thought was right, but I didn't tell tales or anybody on or anything like that, and, which I believe because he's he's just uh, he's quite an unusual guy and a, really a great guy I thought, uh, who must be getting a bit older now. He's, last I knew, he was still living out there. Yes, I think he is. <coughs> yeah. yeah. But so you were at that uh, peace conference, uh, and you were talking another thing that you participated in was, you told me that you spoke, you were invited to speak and sp uh, to uh, Vietnamese lawyers. Was that in Vietnam? Oh, oh, oh. That's 74, I think. 73 or 74. Yeah. Uh, I went on a guild delegation with the uh, uh, national president of the guild, uh, Jim Larson, and um, I want to say Marsha Greenberg, but I don't think it's Marsha is her first name. Anyway, a lawyer from uh, <clears throat> New Mexico. The three of us went for a couple of weeks. You went and, to Vietnam? 
to North Vietnam. North Vietnam. Yeah. Okay, North, these are North Vietnamese lawyers. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, we uh, toured the country and went to villages, went to factories, went to, what's the name, Haran Bay. And, where the, um, and this is while the war was still going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we went to uh, a couple of lawyers' offices, courtrooms, and spoke with, I forget his name, but he was the number three person in the political structure of Vietnam. Early Attorney General, ben, maybe? Ben, ben I don't know. Anyway, one of the three of us wanted to meet with him and find out how to start a communist party <laughs> in the United States. And what he said was, well, you already have a communist party <laughs> in the United States. And I said, yeah, that's true. But anyway, the, one of the fellows I was with on the delegation wasn't deterred and pushed it a little further. And, and so he said, well, if you must know, here's how you go about it. And so he explained how you start a communist party, which I thought was fascinating. Um, but the other thing we did is that we met and were the guests of the Vietnam Lawyers Association. Uh, and they must have brought in the lawyers from all over the North Vietnam because there were like 500 lawyers there, um, most of whom, maybe all of them, had been trained in France. And, you know, a very uh, sophisticated legal audience, I'll put it that way. Uh, and what we had to say was translated. And it was, uh, <coughs> you know, very interesting for us and I'm sure for the audience, but also I got the feeling, I mentioned to you at the time, that the Vietnam Lawyers Association in Vietnam, while it was an important group, uh, they were not on the front lines, so to speak, in the war effort. And so they particularly liked the fact that they were being recognized and hosting a group of lawyers from another country. So it was a, you know, I won't say a love fest, but it was really, they, they were glad that they could host us and we were glad to speak to them. You know, lawyers always have a little bit of a, are we really part of the struggle or not, <laughs> kind of feeling. Uh, well, I guess we're getting close to the end of this. We usually end the, the um, interview by asking how, in those years between 1960 and 75, when you were so active, how has that period of time affected the rest of your life? Did it determine what you did after that? Was it different than what you did during those years? How did it? Sometime, somehow in the middle of this, you got married and had three kids also. Um, so what was the rest of your story after, after this period? What are you doing now? Uh, let me give you just a little bit of the yeah. early part. I mean, I, in uh, 1965, I wandered through the South and ended up in Hattiesburg, Mississippi and worked with SNCC for about a month and ended up sleeping on COFO house floors and stuff like that. And I really just kind of went to see what the hell was going on. But that's really what that month sort of changed my life and caused me to become political, you know. And then when I got back to finishing up law school in Indianapolis, I, I was active in various, various things, Hatcher's campaign for mayor and stuff like that. Um, but afterwards, how was it affected afterwards? Um, I mean, that, the period we've just been talking about in my life is a very important period in my life, but it's also a very important period in the country. Mm -hmm. 60s and 70s, I think, yeah. changed everything. I mean, the civil rights movement really began the change of everything, but the change in consciousness people, you know, whether they participated or not, occurred during those two decades, I think. And uh, so, I mean, I just continued on with uh, a heightened commitment and consciousness and basically doing the same thing. I mean, struggles have changed a little bit. <coughs> uh, I mean, we're still anti-war, not Vietnam, but still anti-war. The globalization movement is, you know, a brand new, different movement, huge, you know, which has led to Occupy, which has led to 
Bernie, you know, in a perverse way, led to Trump. <laughs> Very perverse. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, it's it's kind of a hard question to answer because, in a way, maybe it, you know, um, it solidified things. And but it, because that's a pretty long period of time, and the struggles were very strong and very emotional, it just changed who you are, changed who I was, and because of how I, who I was when I came out of that period, that's just, you know, it's uh, that's just what you do. That's just who you are. <laughs> you know. Of course, having this interview right at the time when Trump has come in and yeah. major demonstrations against him and his various uh, human rights abuse policies, um, do you uh, do you still have a good uh, sense of uh, optimism? I, mean, I saw a sign at one of the demonstrations that I can't believe I'm still protesting this shit. I saw and, that uh, sign. I saw and, that uh, sign. Uh, what does it say? I mean, it, Vigilance, you've got to be out there always. Well, I mean, I'm still optimistic. In fact, I'm more optimistic, to tell you the truth. <clears throat> because while the next four years, and I think it'll only be four years, if that, are going to be tumultuous and terrible and really bad for immigrants and people dependent on health care, I mean, there might be things that happen to them that can't ever be patched up or retrieved. The past year in this terrible presidential campaign, in one sense, really raised the consciousness of the American people. I mean, the phrase working class, you know, who knew? No one ever said that before, or no one said it in, you know, just casual discussion. Well, and, you know, the, the effect on the economy and the, the uh, I just think that the class nature of our society has really been brought to the fore, and it will be even more. I mean, you know, I oppose Trump for 90, 95% of the things that he says and will do. 5% I'll give him maybe if he does something on trade. <laughs> but, uh, but I think he won because of the economy. And I think that an awful lot of the, you know, liberal folks who've been running the country don't really understand that and haven't come to grips with it. And, uh, but they are, and they're going to have to. But anyway, I mean, there's been more real politics discussed, along with all the dirt, in the past year than there have been in the past 20 years, as long as I can remember. Um, so, I mean, that's the basis of potentially really good things to happen. It's also the basis for fascism or something really bad to happen. But, you know, I mean, I kind of have a lot of faith in the American people, really. Uh, and, you know, people who say, well, they're all racist that voted for him are just full of baloney. No, they're all hurting. You know, there's a few racists out there, for sure. But uh, most of the people, you know, the deciding difference of folks that voted for Trump are people that are hurting. And hurting because all the economic policies have been bad for them. So, so in the sense that all of that has come to light, I'm optimistic. And I think even though I voted for Hillary, if she would have won, it would have been four years or eight years wasted. At least, the you know, at least now, you know, you there's a direction towards coming to grips with things. <clears throat> That's not enough to justify it, but, you know, you take, take the good where you can find it. <laughs> so, anyway. Well, thank you, Jim. Yes, Drew. Jim. Uh, this is, um, now, this is not going to be... Not going to be open for 50 years? Is that the. <laughs> It'll be in an archive at GW University. It's going to the torture report. <laughs> Jim, you're also uh, you're married to a woman who is a human, right, uh, human rights uh, attorney, activist. Uh, tell us about her and why 
how you met him, what's her uh, role in the movements? Of yeah, I'm married to Severina Rivera. We have three children, two grandchildren now. And uh, she's a lawyer, human rights lawyer, uh, represented the, what's it called, Office of Good Government in the Philippines uh, here uh, in its efforts to get uh, the monies back from Marcos after Marcos fell. I mean, before then, she and I were very active in the anti-Marcos movement, but, uh, but she was the head of the U.S. operation and the head of the legal operation, and they recovered uh, quite a few millions of dollars and even broke into unprecedented Swiss bank accounts and got some of those monies back. So, so she's had uh, a good and long career. We, we met when I was at Antioch Law School teaching, and she was doing research in the research department of Antioch Law School. And at that time, martial law was declared in the Philippines, and the guild had an office in the Philippines with two or three lawyers who were, it was a GI office. <coughs> uh, the uh, U.S. soldiers would come to that office if they wanted to get out of the army or if they wanted to become conscientious objectors or if they had any legal problem. Anyway, it was a very active office and had been raided by, you know, the Philippines a number of times. But when martial law was declared, they were all arrested and so Severina, who knew that I was in the guild, came to me and said, uh, I don't know, what was it now? Oh, she, she asked if I was going to go and try and get those persons out, you know. And I said, well, I'm, I'm supposed to, because I was supposed to, to go and see if we can get them released. Uh, well, before I could go, they got released. And so I arranged for one of those lawyers to come to Antioch Law School and speak. And so Severina had a long, detailed discussion with him, and then he spoke to the student body. But anyway, I always say to her that, I think I've got this right, that uh, either I would have gone and we would have met in that way, or I would have Oh, I know what it was. I know what it was. I'm just, <laughs> memory is getting to me now. I was supposed to go work in that office, and instead I went to teach at Antioch. So she came to me when I was teaching there, and, you know, if, because she thought I was going to go get the guy. And I said, okay, you know, I'll talk to him. But anyway, he got out before I could go. He came and spoke. So <laughs> I told her, that one way or the other, either because I was teaching and you came to see me, or if I had actually been practicing in that office, you would have come, you would have seen me. So either way, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I told this at a family reunion once, and our nephew said to Sev, you married the wrong guy. <laughs> anyway. So I, I guess it was Dustin, but... Uh, but we've had, you know, a good marriage, good family, and, and good political comrades. Have you ever done a FOIA for your FBI file or any other files? I haven't. Uh, there was a party guy, member of the Communist Party, who did. And uh, maybe someone did it on his behalf. Anyway, the request said that he was, had given information, or the papers that came back from the FBI and he was drummed out of the party, etc. And he died not too long afterwards. And not too long after he died, it was revealed that that was a phony plant. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. you got to be aware of it. Which turned me off to that. But it also turned me off because, you know, people always want to get their FOI file, and the thicker it is, the more important they feel they yeah. are. So <laughs> I just said, to hell with that. I'm not going to mess with them. Whatever they got on me, they got on me. So I haven't. I did give, uh, when we did the COINTELPRO suit, the Lawyers Guild, I gave an authorization to Mike Krinsky and Rabinowitz and Bodine to, to get mine. I never saw it, but they were getting mine and a number of other guild lawyers to see what spying had been going on, you know.
Yeah. Yeah. We had a convention in Atlanta, and what's that? Might have been seventy four, five, six. Well, yeah. Any, anyway, somehow we found out that the FBI, maybe we found it out from the hotel, that they were taking down names of registrants and were pretty active. Um, and so that resulted in the instigation of a lawsuit to find out what they did, what they were doing, and that led us into the COINTELPRO activities, at least against the Guild. Uh, and that was all handled by... You were an early victim of that. Yeah. 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 Which got bigger and bigger. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Rabinowitz and Bodine, and particularly Michael Krinsky, were the attorneys that handled that. Yeah, I mean, the Guild has always been at the center of left struggles, and that is an important organization in and of itself. But also, because the Guild has ties and trust to all the different organizations on the left, um, you know, I think they figure if they tap our phone, they can <laughs> get information from a lot of different sources. Yeah. yeah. So. Hmm. Right. We done. It's our second. Okay. We're done twice. <laughs> <laughs> we should make sure we get that part in. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the, inter the interviewers today are John John Hanahan and myself, Ann Galvin, and our videographer is Peter Roof.